All done. 통님 저 왔습니다. Oh, you're here. 혹시 제가 전에 말한 거 정리해 주셨어요? Of course. Let me begin my presentation. Presentation? Yes. I prepared a presentation so you can see it at a glance. 어, 네. 시작해 주세요. You need to turn off the light. 아, 조명을 또 꺼야 되는군요. 알겠습니다. 감독님 조명 좀 꺼주실래요? Focus, everyone. Here are the countries that established diplomatic relations with South Korea around 60 years ago. It was interesting to see that there were a lot of countries and they're all clustered around 1961 to 1963. Here are the countries that Korea established relations with in 1961. Next, here are the countries Korea established ties with in 1962. There were a lot of countries that established ties with Korea this year. And now for countries that are celebrating the 60th anniversary of diplomatic relations with Korea this year. Let me show you. Oh, 그런데 여기 흥미로운 부분이 하나 있네요. What is it? 유럽 연합이랑도 1963년에 수교를 맺었네요. 그 말은 올해 수교 60주년이라는 말이잖아요. Right. 근데 유럽 연합은 나라가 아니잖아요. 정치, 경제, 통합체 아닙니까? I know. 의회도 따로 있고, 행정부 같은 집행위원회도 있고, 또 사법재판소도 따로 있고요. 또 화폐도 있고, 유로라는 화폐도 있잖아요. That's correct. 갑자기 궁금한 게 유럽 연합과의 수교는 다른 나라들이랑의 수교랑은 다를까요? I'm not sure. I'm curious too. 그럼 우리 어떻게 해야 되죠? What should we do? 알잖아요. Ask the ambassador. 그렇죠. 대사님께 물어보는 게 가장 정확하니까. So, we went to see the EU ambassador. 안녕하세요, 여러분. 대사관 전문 PD 나누리입니다. 오늘 저희가 다리가 되어 한국과 연결해 볼 나라는 나라가 아니지? 땡! 오늘 저희가 다리가 되어 한국과 연결해 볼 연합은 한국과 연결해 볼 공동체는 바로 유럽 연합입니다, 여러분. 와! 줄여서 EU라고도 하죠. European Union. 줄여서 EU. 올해가 한국 유럽 수교 60주년이거든요. 감독님, 그럼 제가 여기서 퀴즈 하나 낼게요. 유럽 연합 회원국 개수는 몇, 몇 개? 26개. 찍었어요? 굉장히 가깝게 틀렸어. 26개가 아니라 여러분 27개입니다. 27개입니다. 여기 국기들이 나가고 있죠. 이 27개 국가들이 다 유럽 연합의 회원이에요. 이 필드에는 대사관이 4개가 있어요. 그 중에 하나가 여기 an organization created to promote Europe's political and economic integration. The name European Union has been around since 1993, but its history begins right after World War II. To overcome the hostility between Germany and France, which was a cause of the war, and realize peace, the Schumann Declaration was announced in France in May 1950, calling for the joint management of the coal and steel industries through a supranational organization. This led six countries, France, West Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg to create the European Coal and Steel Community in August 1952. And in 1957, the European Economic Community was launched for the free movement of capital, goods, labor, and services between member countries, while the European Atomic Energy Community was launched for the joint use of nuclear energy. 
the ECSC, the EC, and Eurocom were unified into the European community in 1967. Afterwards, the European single market was launched in January 1993, and the EU was created by the Maastricht Treaty in November. Economically, the EU is a very large market. Currently, it has 27 member countries, and their combined land mass amounts to 4.2 million square kilometers. The total population of the member countries amounts to 450 million. The EU is one of the three major global players in international trade, along with the US and China. The EU accounts for 14% of world trade in goods. In 2021, the total value of all goods and services produced in the EU, its GDP, amounted to 14.5 trillion euros. What do you think? Do you feel closer to the EU? I'll bring more fun facts about countries for you guys next time. Bye! The ambassador wants to show us something. I was going to show you uh, a bit uh, uh, what do Korean uh, children from uh, 13, 14 years old, middle school, think about the European Union. What you see a little bit through them, apart, it's this feeling of peace. You know, you see the the peace pigeon everywhere, and uh, and that means that uh, you know our children, our generation, want to peace. So. So they are sending the message of peace and strengthening partnership. And strengthen mm -hmm. partnership, mm -hmm. absolutely. Wow. I think these are uh, two, two key messages oh. from, from what our younger generations uh, yes. want from, from mm -hmm. us, and we, we should li listen to them. They are the future of our relationship and of our world. We were about to begin the interview when I noticed that there was a meeting taking place behind where we were supposed to film. What is this meeting? This is from a consular, consular coordination. So all the EU countries, uh, the 24 countries in Korea, we have meetings at political, trade, consular, and ambassador's level. So. Let me begin our interview against the backdrop of a very busy embassy. So, Ambassador, this year marks the 60th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Korea and the EU. So, how do you evaluate Korea-EU relations so far? 60 years is uh, an important uh, benchmark in Korea culture, the one gap. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's a very good opportunity for a new, fresh start. Mm -hmm. It is a very meaningful year for, for all of us uh, uh, to try to push uh, our strategic relations uh, even closer as we share common and values and interests uh, in a very challenging world that we have uh, today. So it's better for partners to stay close and, and to defend uh, you know, fundamental values and uh, UN principles uh, which are at stake. It's also my own one gap. Uh, so for me, uh, I feel part of this story of 60 years of relations between EU and Korea. I was here uh, before when we launched the, FT, the free trade agreement, when we started our negotiations for the partnership agreement, when we started our research agreement. So I've been part of this process. So I feel also uh, a bit uh, even more engaged in, in, in trying to, to establish uh, the new pillars for our relations uh, in the future. Yes, Ambassador Castillo has a deep connection with Korea. Shall we briefly take a look at her relationship with Korea? Korea also has grown into, uh, you know, evolve uh, um, 
very quickly is one of the world examples of how a country can come from the ruins of war into what it is today, the, the tenth of the world economy. Uh, and that enormous development has also brought us closer together uh, and uh, with a lot of substance. Uh, the embassy has grown. Uh, when I first was here, we were around 15, 16 people. Now we are around 29. Oh. So it has doubled in, the, in, in, in 15 years. So you see the interest and the need, you know, for, for covering much more areas uh, than we did uh, before in, in 1963. 2023 marks the 60th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Korea and the European Union. At the time diplomatic ties were established, the EU was ECC, the EU's predecessor. Until the early 1990s, the relationship between Korea and the ECC developed mainly in the field of trade cooperation. And after the end of the Cold War and the launch of the EU in November 1993, bilateral cooperation gradually expanded into the fields of politics and security, with the establishment of political dialogue channels between Korea and the EU and with the EU's expanded foreign and security policies accompanying its integration. In October 1996, the Korea-EU Framework Agreement was signed, which stipulated comprehensive cooperation in various fields, such as economy, trade, culture and science and technology. In addition, the Korea-EU Joint Political Declaration was adopted to institutionalize cooperation and dialogue channels in the political field. After 2000, Korea-EU relations rapidly expanded and developed in various fields, including politics and economy. Accordingly, in May 2010, the existing framework agreement was revised to significantly strengthen cooperation in the field of political affairs. The Korea-EU FTA was signed, with the Framework Agreement and the FTA, Korea and the EU also established a strategic partnership in 2010. And in 2023, during a summit celebrating the 60th anniversary of diplomatic relations this year, the two sides released a joint statement on peace and stability, economy and trade, and sustainable development, which is expected to expand mutual cooperation further. So I think the Korea-EU relationship has two main pillars. One is the EU-Korea Framework Agreement signed in 2010 and maybe FTA. I will say it has three pillars. Oh, okay. Three pillars. Okay. Why three pillars? First, you have the, the, the trade and investment relation and uh, the free trade agreement, which was unique, unique at the time. You know, it was the first one we did with Asia countries and which was a new generation of agreements, which was not only a tariff, non-tariff barrier agreement, but also an agreement who had uh, dispositions on sustainable development, on custom, on intellectual property, on uh, cooperation and competition. Uh, so it was a very large agreement, which was then copied into with different other countries, Singapore, Vietnam, uh, and now with uh, the, the ones that we are dealing with, Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, uh, Philippines. So it has served as an example. And it has made uh, our trade grow enormously, 130 billion euro today, third trading partner of Korea, first investor of Korea. So it has been a win-win agreement for both, and our trade and investment has been non-stop growing. So that is the first pillar. The second pillar is, as you said, the framework agreement, which uh, is an agreement for cooperation uh, together in many areas. We cooperate from areas of security, human rights, uh, cyber, uh, um, non-proliferation, to areas of uh, uh, environment, uh, agriculture, intellectual property, um, health. Uh, so we have a 40 working groups, you know, that come from this agreement, which makes that we discuss, we exchange, we do things together in all these areas. 
the third one I was mentioning is what we call the framework agreement on crisis management. This oh. is the security field. And that means that Korea and the European Union work together to solve crises around the world. Remember the the crisis in Somalia, we call the Operation Atalanta, the piracy in the coast, uh, near the coast of Somalia, where we joined forces with other partners. And through this agreement, Korea naval uh, ships could help us and participate in this operation to try to stop piracy in that part of the world. It was important because Korea is an export driven. Your trade needs to flow through that uh, area and your ships were also you know, targeted at that time. So that, that is important. This crisis operation means that together with Korea, we can work in different conflicts around the world trying to prevent conflicts, uh, solve conflicts, and, and work together. So this is the, the first part of the security pillar, which um, made Korea be one of the first uh, um, countries in Asia where we had the three agreements, the trade, the economic and uh, political cooperation and the security and crisis management. And that's very good. I think we should stop for a minute. I think there, are... yeah, there is. <laughs> it is interesting to see the realistic side of what goes on daily at an embassy. Seeing how the embassy works, for a moment, I felt like I was an embassy staff. Okay, so in May, the two top EU leaders visit Korea. In May, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and the president of the EU Council, Charles Michel, visited Korea to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations. It was the first time in 11 years that the presidents of the European Commission and the EU Council visited Korea together. After the summit, the leaders of both sides announced the Korea-EU Summit Joint Statement, which included strengthening cooperation in areas such as security, environment, and health. The two sides agreed to establish a new Foreign Minister's Strategic Dialogue to strengthen their bilateral security partnership cooperation on global peace and security. Then, the leaders agreed to launch the Korea-EU Green Partnership to strengthen cooperation on tasks related to green transition. In addition, the leaders decided to continue the Digital Partnership Council as a follow-up measure to the Korea-EU Digital Partnership concluded in November 2022, and to strengthen cooperation in the health sector by launching the Administrative Agreement on Health Emergency Preparedness and Response. The two sides agreed to expand their industrial policy dialogue to a supply chain and industrial policy dialogue and expressed an intent to hold the first supply chain and industrial policy dialogue within this year. They also reaffirmed the importance of the Indo-Pacific region and decided to strengthen cooperation with ASEAN, an important stakeholder in the region. In addition, the leaders decided to work to strengthen partnerships with Pacific Island nations. Furthermore, the leaders condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine and North Korea's ballistic missile launches, nuclear development, and possible use of nuclear weapons. So what kind of meaning does their visit hold? Well, it was very important that they came to Korea first. I think it's important for our leaders to get to know the countries uh, better. It was an opportunity for them to have different interlocutors and uh, see what is Korea today uh, with their own eyes. Meaningful because it was also our 60th anniversary, uh, very important, but also because it consolidated our strategic partnership. This means that with uh, some countries, we call them strategic partners because we really uh, share common values, interest. Uh, we are very close. Our leaders meet together both at you know, head of state level, but also ministerial level. And we have a lot of these contacts because our relation is made also through contact, not only through the people, but also through our leadership. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that means that with this, uh, the countries, uh, we, we, we are close and we are ready to contact them quickly and and, and try to together uh, face all the very big challenges that the world has today on, on, on the table. So. 
it was good they came. And uh, I think that set also the basis of our future relationship. Uh, they, we managed to agree a, a very long statement, yes. I know that is a tedious work of us uh, officials and diplomats, but it means a lot because um, that set the basis, as I said, for a fresh start. Mm. Let's take a look at the key parts of the Korea-EU Joint Declaration. I will say four big pillars. Uh, one is um, how we were going to work together for our green and digital transitions. Mm -hmm. Both our societies uh, and our economies have to go through this mm -hmm. transition. We have to uh, do it together and help each other. Mm -hmm. So we establish a green partnership, mm -hmm. our a digital partnership mm. and also uh, we have all gone through this pandemic so the health uh, mm. how we can prevent uh, future uh, global pandemics mm. how we can work together uh, with business with health institutions to prepare ourselves for the future um, so that we are not caught uh, you know uh, in in this very mm. complicated uh, situation with a, with a health uh, mm. pandemic and the fourth pillar is the security pillar, as I mentioned. So we have the three agreements, and now we have three mm -hmm. partnership which complement the agreements. Mm -hmm. Security partnership, we try to explore how we can work together in, mm -hmm. the secre in security cooperation. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we put higher level our meetings with the foreign ministers. Foreign ministers should be um, have a strategic dialogue mm -hmm. and meet more often and trying to, to deal with the very big crisis that we have uh, mm -hmm. today on in the world. So the world order is now changing and some are saying that we are now heading to the new Cold War era. So how should we cooperate in regard to this? Defending multilateralism and defending uh, international law. I mean, we are getting, as you said, in a world where um, it's better to decide things bilaterally than multilaterally. And this is not good. This is not going to um, uh, bring uh, stability, peace, and insure, assurance to, to countries. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can have a situation where you decided to, uh, you know, this is my influence zone, and then I can just go uh, and, and attack countries. Uh, this, is, this is not um, possible. The United Principles were there because they established rules for everyone, every country, the small countries and the big ones equally. And we think as, as Europeans that uh, international law should be preserved and the UN Charter is there, is valid, is there to be, uh, to be uh, respected. Um, and multilateral solutions are always better than bilateral solutions. Um, as much countries can support uh, and can adhere to a solution, uh, the better uh, and the more lasting it will be. And multilateralism has worked and it, 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 I think we should defend it. And uh, Korea is uh, also um, one of the most outspoken uh, defenders of multilateralism and international law. But it is not easy to have a multilateral revolution that satisfies everyone. No, of course. But this is also, you know, it's, 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 it's also, look what happens in, in, in Europe, how we, we, you need consensus, you need to find, there's always a common denominator, and uh, there has been uh, uh, agreements that are still working, uh, well, the Paris Agreement, the SDGs Agreement, so it's still possible, there is still, um, you know, issues like climate, even digitalization, it will be very difficult to do it uh, bilaterally. And uh, the idea was we need to help each other. Uh, at European level, of course, not all the 27 countries have the same uh, interests. We have to find a common denominator, which, and some countries sometimes have to give something. Uh, and this, uh, uh, I think this give and take is part of diplomatic negotiations, but uh, it's also, you know, one day I give you something and another day you give me something. So it's also more easy, perhaps, between trusted partners. 
with who share uh, similar values and, and, and interests like Korea and the European Union. The importance of reaching a consensus when opinions differ between countries struck me. So what should be the premise in order to successfully reach a consensus? I was able to find my own answer to this at the EU Embassy event held a few days later. What kind of event is taking place here? This is an event to celebrate European Day of Languages. Did you know that September 26 is celebrated as the European Day of Languages? An event to commemorate this was also held in Korea a bit later, in mid-October. We have the European languages. You know, uh, Europe has 22 official languages, which are also part of our uh, rich uh, cultural diversity, which is very important. So we are trying to promote this European diversity of languages. So we, we want to reach out to parents, to, to families who will be strolling around uh, Seoul Station. Can we film that as well? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, you <laughs> could come on the 14th. <laughs> Here, we can visit the booths of the EU member countries and experience the language and culture of each country. 그러면 저도 여기 EU 언어의 날 행사장 체험을 좀 해보려고 합니다. 저와 함께 가시죠. 아 감사합니다. 어 이렇게 여권. No wonder I saw people carrying a blue notebook in their hand. 아 사람들이 왜 이거 들고 다니는 줄 알았어요. 이거 이렇게 부스 돌아다니면서 도장 깨기 하는 거예요. 스티커 붙여주고. 네. 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 I had fun here and learned a lot of new information about EU member states. Remember how I said I found my own answer to what must be the premise to successfully reach a consensus? It is this. Learning about countries and cultures that are different from mine, thinking from other people's perspectives. Shouldn't the first starting point in reaching consensus come from interest in the other party? ま、基本的にインサンバルで、それをモナドルで、こういうのが好きだと思います。あ、オネプスエソ、地方の人々に、フルガリアを、インサ。うん。フルガリアを、基本表現で、アレオデリゴ。え、てげさ、てめけ、
So when you have a calendar ready, yes, we will send to our calendar. Absolutely. <laughs>